frankly, we're still under-resourced. I think the public doesn't fully appreciate yet the scope of the problem. Uh, and my hope is, is that by being here today, hearing from people who have gone through heroic struggles with this issue, hearing from the medical community about what they're seeing, uh, that we've got the opportunity to really make a dent on this. I think my path into addiction, which eventually was heroin addiction, um, is pretty similar to a lot of people's stories. They start out with the Vicodin, low milligrams, not knowing how addictive it can be, using it recreationally until then they need it. Um, that's what happened with me. Um, it slowly happened um, from weekend to then needing it throughout the week, needing something to go to work. Eventually, I needed something stronger than the Vicodin. I was doing Oxycontins, Dilaudid, things like that, until then it eventually led into me doing heroin. Um, Can you talk about that? How, when you say it eventually led to heroin, what, what, what does that mean? Well, I was physically addicted, and the, the higher milligram things like Oxycontin and Dilaudid, to me, are pretty much like heroin. They're like um, synthetic heroin. They're almost as strong. So when it came to the point and I couldn't find those kinds of pills, I had to go to the street to prevent my withdrawal symptoms so that I could participate in my daily life, my children, getting them to school, me going to work. So that's how I got into using heroin after the pills. You, you, again, you have two children. Yes. And, and you, were, you were doing this in order to be able to function, it sounds like. Where, yeah. I mean, so the heroin, where, where were you using it? In my home, in the bathroom, while my kids were there. Um, while they were at school. It was so much a part of my life. It was, it was a part of my life. You know, it's crazy to think about now, the things that I did. But it was necessary, or I wouldn't have been able to function. Who do you, who do you call, if you will? I mean, what did, what did you do when you started to, to, to get help? How did you, where, where did you even begin? Um, well, I tried a few times on my own. It didn't work. I personally couldn't get through the withdrawal symptoms. I couldn't tough it out. I know some people can. I couldn't do it. Um, this last time has been the most successful recovery for me. Um, I've been in recovery about a year, and I thank you. This, you've, you've tried this a bunch of times, and, mm -hmm. and now you've been a year again in recovery. Yes. Is there something that worked this time? I mean, for people out there who say, I, it just doesn't work for me, I, I've tried, it doesn't work. What worked this time for you? I think this time I wanted it more than anything. And taking that step forward along with the support that I get from my family and Mumada, um, advocating, I mean, this helps. Getting out there, telling my story and helping other people helps me and it makes me want to stay in recovery and keep doing what I'm doing. Great, well, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. You're an ER doctor. What, how did you get into this? What, why, why is this issue so important for you? Actually, a very similar story to Crystal's. I saw a patient who I got to know over the course of her getting treated in the ER. When you know someone very well as an ER doctor, you know there's something wrong. But this woman was in her late 20s. She was a competitive swimmer. She tore discs in her back and started out with prescription pain pills, but then got addicted to, to them and then switched to heroin. And this was a woman who was in a downward spiral and she recognized that she was losing her job. She was about to lose her kids. She was homeless and she came to us basically every week in the ER. Mm -hmm. And she knew that she needed help. I mean, this was someone who came to us every week saying, I want help for my addiction. And it's one of the worst realizations as a doctor. It's one of the most humbling things and worst feelings as a doctor to know that you can't help them. That what this patient needed, what so many of our patients need is treatment, addiction treatment at the time that they're requesting it. But we couldn't give it. I mean, we would never say that to someone who 
who has a heart attack. We would never say, go home, and if you haven't died in three weeks, come back and get treated. So that's what we faced, and I remember that I talked to her this one time about getting into treatment. She really wanted to do it. We set her up with an appointment, but it wasn't until two weeks later. And she went home that day and overdosed and came back to us in the ER. We tried to resuscitate her, but we couldn't save her. And I think about her all the time because she had come to us so many times requesting treatment. And yet, clearly there is a difference between how we treat her and how we treat everybody else. Because we need to recognize that addiction is a disease. If we treat addiction like a crime, then we're doing something that's not scientific, that's inhumane, and it's frankly ineffective. Uh, the fact is that for too long, we have viewed uh, the problem of drug abuse generally in our society through the lens of the criminal justice system. Now, uh, we are putting enormous resources into drug interdiction. Uh, when it comes to uh, heroin that is being shipped in from the south, you know, we are working very aggressively with the Mexican government to prevent an influx of more and more heroin. We're staying on uh, cutting off the pathways for these drugs coming in. But what we have to recognize is in this global economy of ours uh, that the most important thing we can do is to reduce demand for drugs. And the only way that we reduce demand is if we're providing treatment and thinking about this as a public health problem and not just a criminal problem. Now, the, uh, this, is a, this is a shift that uh, began very early on in my administration. And you know, there's a reason why uh, my drug czar uh, is somebody who came not from the criminal justice side, but came really from the treatment side and himself uh, has been in recovery for decades now. Uh, because it's this was something that uh, this is something that I think we understood fairly early on, now, and I think we have to be honest about this. Uh, part of what has made it previously difficult to emphasize treatment over cr the criminal justice system it has to do with the fact that the populations affected in the past were viewed as or stereotypically identified as uh, poor minority, and as a consequence, the thinking was it is often a character flaw in those individuals who live in those communities, and it's not our problem that they're just being locked up. Uh, and I think that uh, you know, one of the things that's changed in this opioid debate is a recognition that this reaches everybody. And uh, so there's a real opportunity not to reduce uh, our aggressiveness when it comes to uh, you know, the drug cartels who are trying to poison our families and our kids. We have to stay on them and be just as tough, but a recognition that in the same way that we reduce tobacco consumption, uh, and I say that as an ex-smoker, uh, in, the, in, in the same way that in the same way that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've greatly reduced traffic fatalities because we applied a public health uh, approach so that you know, my daughter's generation uh, understands very clearly you don't drive when you're drunk, you put on your seatbelt. Uh, and we also then instituted uh, requirements for things like seatbelts and airbags and, and re-engineered roads, all designed to reduce fatalities. If we take the same approach here, uh, it can make a difference. So when I'm listening to Crystal and I'm thinking, what a powerful story, uh, I want to make sure that for all the other crystals out there who are ready to make a change, that they're not waiting for three months or six months in order to be able to access treatment. Uh, because.
First of all, I think you'd agree that if, if all we were doing was dispensing uh, the drug that is blocking uh, your, your cravings for uh, an opioid, but you weren't also in counseling and uh, working with families, et cetera, it's shown that it doesn't work as well. Uh, we've got to make sure that uh, in every county across America, that's available. And the problem we have right now uh, is that treatment is greatly underfunded. The, the, and, 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 you know, it's particularly underfunded in a lot of rural areas. We, uh, our task force, when we were looking at it, uh, figured out that in about 85 percent of counties in America, uh, there are just a handful or no mental health and drug treatment facilities that are easily accessible for the populations there. So if you get a situation in which somebody's in pain initially because of a disc problem, they may not have health insurance because maybe the governor didn't expand Medicaid like they should have under the ACA. Um, they go to a doctor one time when the pain gets too bad, the doctor is prescribing painkillers, they run out, and it turns out it's cheaper to get heroin on the street than it is to try to figure out how to refill that prescription. You got a problem. And, and that's why, for all the good work that Congress is doing, it's not enough just to uh, provide the architecture and the structure for more treatment, there has to be actual funding for the treatment. And we have proposed in our budget an additional billion dollars for drug treatment programs in counties all across the country. And my hope is, is that uh, all the advocates and folks and families who are here and those who are listening uh, say to Congress, this is a priority. We've got to make sure that uh, uh, incredibly talented young people like Krista are in a position where they can get the treatment when they need it. Okay. Okay.